O oh Lord, you are our refuge. You are our refuge from your own holy justice, whose standard we could never meet. You are our refuge because you in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, paid for our sins. And if we fear you, if we come under you, our rock, we have nothing else to fear. The world cannot take us from you. Our greatest enemies cannot dislodge us from your love. And so in the gospel, we are secure. Not just rescued, but also transformed. And we are here before you this morning as your people purchased by your blood. To listen together to your word. We pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would shape us, change us, even this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to, as we begin this morning, give just a brief announcement. Next Sunday is our TES Sunday. TES stands for the Expositor's Seminary. And there are several ways that uh, we raise funds to support that ministry. One is a golf tournament in the spring, and the other is a TES Sunday in the fall. And, and what we like to do in the fall in this TES Sunday is talk about why we are training pastors inside this church? Why, why do we not send people away to train at some school to become pastors? Because fundamentally we believe that pastors for ministry in the church ought to be trained in the church. Uh, some of the best training that doctors receive is with actual patients. Uh, some of the best training that pastors receive is in the life and ministry of the church as it lives and breathes. And so uh, that is something that we're committed to. Uh, and so to help raise funds to run the administration and the technology for 12 churches joined together by a live virtual classroom, which is what this seminary is, the, the various churches and their pastors function as the faculty of the training institution. In order to provide for that, we have uh, these two fundraisers. And so next week, I'll be spending some time in the morning talking about what it means to train men in the local church. And we will also have a special offering. So I'm telling you this now so that you can prepare your hearts, prepare yourself uh, to give towards that ministry on that special Sunday next week. Well, I invite you this morning to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. And as you're turning there, I want to begin with a made-up story about a made-up boxer. We're going to call him Red. Red. And like Cassius Clay, he goes by different names. Like Mike Tyson, he devours his opponents. Like Don King, he makes the rules and rules the ring. And Red, the made-up boxer, was the best boxer the world ever knew. Cunning and strong, he outsmarted everyone and he brutalized his opponents. He was famous for low blows and cheating of every sort. He ran the boxing world. And this boxer finally got into the ring with his arch nemesis, a fighter with some promise. He didn't look like much, but he always seemed to escape Red's crushing blows. Every time Red landed a blow that laid him out or cut him till he cried out, it only served the purposes of his inevitable victory. It seemed that every raging attack only played into the strategy of this other fighter. Red lost, and the victor left the ring in triumph. In his rage, Red looked around the stadium, found his rival's mom in the audience, and beat her to a pulp nearly to death. Then he turned on the whole crowd, looking on anyone he could pummel. Now, this made-up story of a made-up boxer hints at the real story of our adversary, the devil. We have been tracing the long and illustrious career of Satan in this world. He is that malevolent boxer. He is defeated but angry, seeking to wreak havoc in the world, eager to deceive and destroy everyone he can get his hands on. And the worst is yet to come. 
The worst is yet to come for the nation of Israel. The worst is yet to come for followers of Jesus. The worst is yet to come for the world. And the worst is yet to come for Satan himself. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal, but Satan is no match for God. He is therefore no match for the people of God, for God Almighty is our defender. God's people are overcomers. They are faithful and they are victorious. As in the life of Job, Satan cannot undo the promises of God. He cannot undo the supernatural work of God in the hearts of his people. In Revelation 12, we will discover that Satan will not be able to break God's promises to Israel. Nor will he be able to extinguish the faith of the followers of Jesus, though he will do his worst in trying. Let's read together our text for this morning. Revelation 12, verses 13 through 17. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the witness of Jesus. What is this passage all about? I have it for you up here on the screen. As Satan's assault on God and his people moves to the earth, we witness a series of moves and counter moves. Punches and counter punches in this round of fighting between God and Satan. The series of punches thrown by Satan are the flailing, unproductive swings of a punch drunk boxer who is running out of strategies. He's lost his footwork and his composure, and he is lashing out in a flurry of malevolent fury. While the sovereign God of the universe, like a skilled fighter, uses the adversary's lunges against him, leading him to his one inevitable outcome, total defeat. The outcome of this fight is not in doubt. God is sovereign. He is the one in charge. And the Apostle John in this chapter is something of a commentator, maybe like a sports broadcaster, giving us the play-by-play of this final round before Satan's thousand-year incarceration. And it goes something like this. Heaven throws Satan out. Satan attacks the Jews in Israel. God removes the Jews from Israel. Satan sends a flood to kill the Jews. The earth swallows the flood. Satan attacks any follower of Jesus he can find. And the followers of Jesus overcome. That's the storyline. That's the play-by-play at the end of chapter 12. Let's look at the first punch thrown. this, This first move. It's in verse 13. Heaven throws Satan out. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, uh, this takes us back to last week when there was war in heaven and Satan wasn't strong enough and he lost and was thrown down never to return to the throne room of God. So now his only domain from this point forward, from that future point forward, will be the earth. Look at verse 12. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he only has a short time. Satan is disbarred from heaven, expelled, and he's frustrated and enraged. And there is no cure for Satan. There is no repentance. His unrepentant depravity will lead him to take out his frustration on anyone he can get a hold of. Heaven will be clean. But the earth will be in for its worst period of history ever. This is a vision given to John the Apostle in symbols. Remember back in verse 1, we saw the great sign appeared in heaven. And in verse 3, another sign appeared in heaven. In verse 3, this sign is the great red dragon. In verse 9, he's identified as Satan. 
Satan is not a figment of mythology. He is a real personal spiritual being. He is the chief of the fallen angels. He is the enemy of God and the enemy of mankind. He has spent his entire career as a murderous deceiver of humanity. The word dragon is used to describe him, again here in verse 13, to remind us of the nature of what John is seeing. It is a vision. It is a vision of symbols that represent actual persons and actual historical events, future historical events. What is portrayed are, are real events that will happen on the earth. And when Satan is thrown out of heaven, he will not slink away to some quiet spot on the earth to mope and pout and cry. He will not say, oh, woe is me. No, it will be woe to the earth as he redirects his rage. Chapter 13 tells us how he will fight this fight. Lord willing, we will get to this in a couple of weeks. He will fight this fight through a human called the beast or the Antichrist. Look down at chapter 13 verse 1. The dragon stood on the sand of the seashore, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads. We'll look at the career of, of Satan's front man, the Antichrist, during this time, Lord willing, in a couple of weeks. Notice what Satan does when he gets to the earth, knowing that his time is short. He's not sipping Mai Tais on a beach somewhere. Here's the second punch thrown in this play-by-play. -play. Satan attacks the Jews in Israel. Look at verse 13. When the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Again, the woman in this vision is a symbol for the nation of Israel. And the male child described, according to verse 5, is none other than Jesus. He is the one who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. His kingdom is coming. Satan would love to stop it. Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of his father. And Satan couldn't get at him anymore. And so who does he turn his fury toward? To mom, as it were. The, the nation who gave birth to the male child. He turns his hate on the nation that bore Messiah. And Satan hates Israel. Her very existence declares the truth of God's word and the faithfulness of God's character. You see, God has made promises to a people, to Israel, genetic, ethnic Israel, that have not yet been fulfilled. And despite all of Satan's attempts to exterminate the Jewish people, they still exist. They are a living testament to the integrity of God. You might remember the career of Antiochus Epiphanes. You can read about it in 1 Maccabees chapter 1. Uh, that's not a book in your Bible, but it is a book written between the Old Testament and New Testament that tells the story of Satan's evil intent through the Grecian Empire to exterminate the Jews and eradicate Judaism. The Romans did the same thing in the second century. They were tired of the, the, these Jewish people in the land of Palestine continuing to rebel against the Roman Empire in their ways. And, and Rome sought to completely exterminate. It led to the, the fortress holdout at Masada uh, where the, the Jews stood on the, the top of the mountain and, and killed themselves so as not to be taken. In 415 AD, all Jews were expelled from Alexandria, Egypt. And this pattern continues throughout history. The nations of Europe passed laws to expel Jews from their lands. And with expulsion of Jews, the, the, the benefit was the confiscation of their property. So get the Jews out and you can have their stuff. It was the Visigoths of southern France in 612 that demanded that all Jews in southern France either be baptized or expelled. As cities and regions of Italy, France, England, Spain, and Switzerland throughout the 1200s followed suit, expelling the Jews from their cities. In 1290, England, under King Edward I, expelled all Jews out of England. Hungary did the same thing in 1360, France in 1394, Austria in 1420, Spain in 1492, Lithuania in 1495, and Portugal in 1496. These European countries expelling by law all Jews from their borders. In the 1516 and 1700s, cities all over Europe were expelling or executing Jews. In 1862, 
Jews were expelled from Tennessee, Mississippi, and Kentucky by Ulysses S. Grant. I don't know if you knew that. The Russians jumped on the bandwagon in the late 1800s and, of course, were familiar with the 20th century. Nazi Germany began its systematic, satanic attempt at the total liquidation of the Jews, dubbed the Final Solution. Satan has been behind the Crusades, the Inquisitions, the pogroms, the ghettos, and the gas chambers. He hates the woman who gave birth to Messiah. He seeks to discredit God by voiding God's promises. You see, if Israel no longer exists, God can't keep his word. And during the tribulation, that future worst period of human history that's coming, Jerusalem will again be the center of activity and the Jews will be concentrated in the land. And we know from the book of Daniel, from Jesus himself in Matthew 24, and from the book of Revelation, that there will be a temple rebuilt in Jerusalem. That there will be a temporary peace treaty between Israel and the nations around her, but that treaty will prove to be a sham. Verse 13 in chapter 12 picks up when the treaty is broken. We'll find out more about that when Antichrist says, there's going to be peace, I can make peace in the Middle East, and he makes everybody happy for a few years, and then he breaks the bargain. Verse 13 in this chapter picks up where that bargain is broken. When Satan comes down to the earth and through the Antichrist persecutes the nation of Israel. Satan will employ the beast and the world's arm and armies to try one more time to exterminate the Jews. Satan's attempt to discredit God will not succeed. Satan has a plan for Israel that they would no longer exist. But God has a plan for Israel that they would believe the gospel, populate a thousand year golden era of peace and prosperity on the earth, and be a blessing to all the nations. That's God's promise. All the way back to Genesis 12. The third move in this fight between God and Satan. Satan seeks to exterminate the Jews, but in verse 14, God removes the Jews from Israel. Look down at the verse. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Remember, this is a, a vision with symbols. The, the Satan, the person, the fallen angel, is called a dragon and a snake here. And, and Israel is called a woman. And I think likewise, the two wings of the great eagle, eagle are symbolic. They are symbolic just like the woman and the dragon are symbolic here, of real events and real happenings. And I believe the two wings of the great eagle are a supernatural means of rescue and preservation for Israel. I don't believe we know yet what those means will be. If you're thinking El Al is the name of the Israeli airline, it's going to be airplanes. Or if you've thought that uh, America jumps in because, you know, our, we, we have the eagle uh, careful with that one. The Roman Empire had eagles and Nazi Germany had eagles. So uh, I don't think those are the answers. Listen to Exodus 19.4. This isn't the first time God would rescue Israel and even use this same metaphor. Exodus 19.4 says, You yourselves had seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Do you see how God described the exodus, a supernatural departure from slavery in Israel out into the wilderness for Israel's preservation? Deuteronomy 32 says the same thing, beginning in verse 10. He found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of a wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young. He spread his wings and he caught them. He carried them on his pinions. Yahweh alone guided him and there was no foreign God with him. This is a picture of supernatural assistance of a swift escape. The way David des describes his hope in the Lord in Psalm 55, he said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. Behold, I would wander far away, I would lodge in the wilderness. I would hasten to my place of refuge from the stormy wind and tempest. 
Revelation 12 is borrowing language from that psalm and from the verbiage describing the Exodus to describe what will take place for Israel during the tribulation. Do you remember 1 Kings 18? There Elijah is running away from Ahab and he has to run a long distance and Ahab has faster transportation and Elijah outruns him. Interestingly, 1 Kings 18.46 tells us that Elijah outran Ahab with the help of Yahweh. He was fleet-footed supernaturally. And notice in Revelation 12.14 that Israel is taken to her place. Uh, This is away from Jerusalem, away from Judea, but an unnamed place. And you may remember that Jesus, when he's talking about the end times, he's actually given instruction to people who will be here during this period. And he says, if you're in Judea, flee. And he tells him, flee to the wilderness, flee to the mountains, Matthew 24, 16. And Daniel chapter 11 also gives us a window into this period. And he says, Antichrist will enter the beautiful land and many countries will fall. But the following countries will be rescued out of Antichrist's hand. Edom, Moab, and the foremost of the sons of Ammon. So the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, they inhabited the mountainous wilderness east of Jerusalem and Judea. So if Daniel 11.41 is giving us a geographical reference for the events here in Revelation 12, then that means that Israel's fleet or flight is into the mountainous regions east of Jerusalem. And what happens there? She is nourished for a time and times and half a time. How would the people fleeing Jerusalem in that day provide for themselves on the run without preparation in wilderness areas? Jesus says, don't go down and get your stuff out of your house. If you're on the rooftop, just go. How are they going to provide for themselves? Do, do they have emergency bags? What, what about all of their rations? Have, have they put together MREs? Have they been preppers? No, they are completely without preparation here. And you need to think Exodus. Do you remember the manna that for 40 years sustained them in the wilderness? That was supernatural, miraculous provision. Do you remember the shoes and clothes that did not wear out for 40 years? Think about Elijah on the run in 1 Kings 17. For 40 days he was in the wilderness and God fed him supernaturally. You see, one of the great purposes of the great tribulation is specific to Israel. The Old Testament is full of descriptions of the great tribulation period. And one of the stated purposes is for the purification of Israel. It is called the troubling of Jacob. It is the time when God will take Israel out into the wilderness and bring them to the end of self-reliance. Listen to Micah 5.10. It will be in that day, declares Yahweh, that I will cut off your horses from among you and destroy your chariots. In other words, the implements, the military implements of Israel's self-defense will go away. God's going to break the iron dome. He's going to remove from Israel. Modern day Israel has has some of the best resources for military defense of anybody in the world. And they need it for their own survival. But that is a matter of military self-reliance. During the great tribulation, God is going to strip it away. Listen to Hosea 1.5. On that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Modern state of Israel's world-class defense systems will not help them when Satan is thrown out of heaven and the Antichrist is on the scene. They will instead run for their lives. And this is precisely God's plan to bring them to repentance. Listen to Hosea 2, verses 14 and 15. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, I will bring her into the wilderness, and I will speak kindly to her. Then I will give her her vineyards from there, and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She will sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. What's coming for Israel is a second exodus. 
And the Valley of Achor was the first location, the first geographical city from the wilderness into the land of Canaan in the first exodus. And God is saying, again, I'm going to bring you through the Valley of Achor. It will be a door of hope for you again. This is exodus redone. And the second exodus, according to the Old Testament prophets, will be one that will overshadow the first. When Charlton Heston is is in part two, (laughs) it, it won't be out of Egypt into the promised land. It'll be out of the great tribulation into the millennial kingdom. Notice verse 14, there's a time stamp here. Time, times, and half a time. 3.5 times. Uh, What is a time? Uh, If we compare this time frame to all the other descriptions, 1260 days, three and a half years, 42 months, uh, we understand this is the same time period that is described elsewhere in the book of Revelation, as well as in Daniel 7 and in Daniel 9. This is the period of Antichrist's rule. When Satan is thrown out of heaven and he energizes the Antichrist to reveal himself and be worshipped by the world, Israel will be thrown out of Jerusalem by the Antichrist, but protected and preserved by God in the wilderness. That's the time period we're talking about. Why is this such a specific period of time? Why 1260 days according to verse 6 or uh, a year plus two years, plus a half a year. That's your three and a half times. Why so specific? Listen to Jesus' words in Matthew 24, 22. This is sobering. This is a sobering picture into how awful this time period will be. Jesus said, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. A very specific, short period of time because it will be so bad that nobody would have survived otherwise. So what does this fight look like so far? Heaven throws Satan out. Satan attacks the Jews in Israel. God removes the Jews from Israel. What is Satan's counter move? Look down at verse 15. Satan sends a flood to kill the Jews. Read it with me. And the serpent poured water out like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. You can imagine Satan with with all his vehemence and all of his energy and he's got Israel surrounded and they got away? It's inconceivable. He's got to come up with another strategy. He he can't get them in the land, so he sends a flood after them to chase them down and exterminate them in one blow. If you spent much time in Arizona, perhaps out in the desert regions, perhaps in monsoon season, you may have experienced flash floods. They are rapid. They are dangerous. Uh, They can happen on a clear blue sky because rain is falling somewhere else up in the hills and it rushes down these dry gullies and it brings a torrent of mud and and gravel and boulders and logs down with it and and it washes out all the basins and kills people. Satan is seeking to, to send something like this in a torrent of his rage against the people he couldn't get in the land. Now, this flood in verse 15 is either a a literal flood of water, and it could be that, or in keeping with the symbols in this vision, a a different kind of flood, a a flood of armies in pursuit of God's people. I think that's probably what's in view here. And this is nothing new to the metaphors used in Scripture for this very kind of thing. The prophet Jeremiah described Nebuchadnezzar's army this way. He said, thus says Yahweh, Jeremiah 47 verse 2, Behold, waters are going to rise from the north, that is Babylon or Chaldea, and become an overflowing torrent and overflow the land and all its fullness, the city and those who live in it. And the men will cry out and every inhabitant of the land will wail because of the noise of the, and listen to this, galloping hooves of his stallions, the tumult of chariots, the rumbling of wheels. There you get an explanation of the symbol. The symbol is a flood. What does the symbol represent? The actual historical army of the Babylonians. Chariots and horses and wheels. And because of the noise of them, the fathers have not turned back for their children. 
Uh, what, a, what an awful scene that is. Everybody just running, every man for himself. Similar images used in Jeremiah 46 about Pharaoh Necho. Necho was the Pharaoh of Egypt that killed King Josiah on the battlefield. And listen to how Jeremiah describes it. Who is this that rises like the Nile? Like the rivers whose waters surge about. Egypt rises like the Nile, even like the rivers whose waters surge about. And he has said, I will rise and cover that land. I will surely destroy the city and its inhabitants. The symbol is the Nile River. The reality is the Egyptian armies attacking God's people. Daniel uses the same illustration of Alexander the Great and the Grecian Empire. Uh, Between the Old Testament and the New Testament, in Daniel 11, he describes it this way. His sons will mobilize and assemble a multitude of great forces. One of them will keep on coming and will overflow and pass through that he may again wage war up to his very fortress. The overflowing forces will be flooded away before him and shattered. Those who eat his choice food will destroy him and his army will overflow. Many will fall down slain. At the end of the time, the king of the south will collide with him and the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, with horsemen and with many ships, and he will enter countries, overflow them and pass through. And you see there the soldiers and the implements of war are described as a great flood taking over lands and destroying people. I believe Satan's counterpunch here in verse 15 is a flood of armies that defenseless Israel could not withstand. Jewish refugees trekking through the wilderness, chased by powerful armies. That sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? What is God's next move? Before we move to verse 16, I want you to think about what God does when He takes away self-reliance. He will do that nationally in the end times for Israel. But there's a sense in which to get us to the end of ourselves so that we will believe our need of a Savior, God strips us of self-reliance, a dependence on our own righteousness, a dependence on our own resources. The gospel brings us to the very end of ourselves when, when we see that we don't have what it takes to be pleasing to God. We don't have what it takes to make sense out of life. We don't have what it takes to be who we're supposed to be as God's creatures. And when you finally give up striving on the hamster wheel of self-improvement and you realize you need to abandon ship, the, the ship of self-reliance, And you trust Christ. Then you realize you get life and everything. And God is so kind to bring us to this point. And we see in this ongoing cosmic war that God will bring Israel as a nation to that very point. So what is God's next move? Verse 16. The earth swallows the flood. Notice the text, but the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river with the dragon, which the dragon poured out of his mouth. Once again, in Israel's history, they will see the mighty hand of God come to their rescue in miraculous and dramatic fashion, cornered in the wilderness with nowhere to run, hopeless and helpless. And what does God do? God opens the earth to swallow the flood. Again, this imagery is is like the things God has done before. Do you remember when Pharaoh chased Israel, with Pharaoh with all of his armies, all the chariots and all the horses, and he's chasing a a band of two million refugees trekking through the wilderness, whatever they could carry, defenseless and cornered against the Red Sea. And... God buried the Egyptian army. Listen to how Exodus 15, 12 describes it. You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. In fact, the Jewish commentary on Exodus 15, 12 says it this way, the earth opened its mouth and consumed them. A similar language to what we have right here in verse 16. The earth helped the woman, the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out. A similar thing happened during Korah's rebellion in the book of Numbers. You remember that there was a group of people 
uh, led by Korah and his associates who didn't trust God. They didn't trust Moses. They, they were complainers and agitators, and they led a rebellion. And number 16 describes their end this way. As he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and their households and all the men who belonged to Korah with their possessions. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive to Sheol, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. Could you imagine being on the edge when that rift opened up? And Korah and his followers went down into the earth. Numbers 26.10 adds this detail. When the earth opened its mouth to consume them, fire devoured them. So maybe you envision a fracture in the surface of the earth. And and at the bottom of this fracture is the exposed magma. And the rebels falling in and the earth closes back up over them and they're gone forever. Forever. God will repeat these kinds of supernatural interventions in order to bring about his intended purposes for world history. What a sight to see. That Satan in his anger over Israel, his hatred of God, his hatred of Messiah, and therefore running down to the earth to to pummel the woman who gave birth to Messiah. And God defeats every blow. In this back and forth boxing match, heaven threw Satan out. Satan attacked the Jews in Israel. God removed the Jews from Israel. Satan sends a flood to kill the Jews. The earth swallows the flood. The earth swallows those antagonistic armies. It just opens up and eats them all. Nothing he does seems to be working out. You ever had one of those days? (laughs) Everything you tried just comes to nothing. Will Satan relent? Will he retreat? Will he repent? No, of course, he will continue in his blind rage. His next move is in verse 17. Satan attacks any follower of Jesus he can find. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and have the witness of Jesus. Satan can't get Jesus. He can't accuse God's people in heaven anymore. He can't exterminate Israel Who else can he go after? Well, anyone affiliated with Jesus. Anyone loyal to Jesus anywhere on the earth. In his anger against God, Satan will turn his wrath upon anyone who is loyal to God. And he will ravage the whole world to do it. In fact, for the entirety of the world, and and this is why heaven says, Woe to the earth! In his hatred of God and his people, Satan will dominate the world. He will ravage the world just to vent his anger. The text tells us he went away to make war. That is away from Jerusalem and Judea. He he was there in Jerusalem at, at the capital of the world's activities during that time in order to exact revenge on the nation of Israel. Israel escapes protected by God and so Satan goes away from there. Where does he go? to the rest of the world, to hunt down, and notice, to hunt down the rest of her children or the rest of her seed. Uh, Who are these? Well, if the woman is Israel, then these are not Jews. These are someone else. Uh, But they are called here the rest of her children. I believe these are Gentiles who become believers during the tribulation. There's biblical precedent for thinking of Gentiles this way. Galatians 3, 7 says, Be sure that those who are of the faith of Abraham are also sons of Abraham. Jews and Gentile alike are called brothers and sisters to Jesus. And notice in this a unity and a distinction with Jews and Gentiles. One of the great tensions in our New Testament is Jew-Gentile relationships in the church era. That was difficult for Jews to get a hold of. But Jew and Gentile are united in Christ by the same faith. They love the same Messiah. They are saved by the same blood shed on the cross. They are on a level playing field in the gospel. For every Jew that believes and every Gentile believes, we are one. 
And this is true throughout church history. So much so that Paul could say there is neither Jew nor Gentile among you, all on an equal playing field. In the same breath, Paul also says there is neither male or female or slave nor free. I hope you understand what Paul is saying. There is an ethnic distinction, Jew and Gentile. Just as there is a gender distinction or occupational distinction that remains with appropriate instructions for all of them. But there is a unity and level playing field in the grace of God that brings them all together. In fact, Jew and Gentile together in one body called the church was a mystery from the Old Testament perspective, not revealed until the New Testament. And what you see during the Great Tribulation is still the unity in the faith between Jew and Gentile, even while God plays out his distinctive purposes for the nations on the world stage. Look at Revelation chapter 7. We looked at this some time ago. I want to remind you of this scene. In the first half of Revelation chapter 7, you get a detailed description of Jewish male evangelists, 144,000 of them, sealed during the tribulation, that is, protected from martyrdom, who will be effective in proclaiming the gospel throughout the earth during that time. And they were described as 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes listed there in the first half. And then in verse 9, we read, After these things I look, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count. Okay, there's your first contrast. 144,000 is a countable number. A different group of people no one could count. Notice the next contrast. They're from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues. That is, not from the 12 tribes of Israel. These are Gentiles. And according to verse 9, they are standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, palm branches in their hands. That is, they are in heaven. Now, who are these? Who is this different group that is not Jewish? We find out in verse 14, the, the elder in heaven had to answer John's question. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. They're in the sanctuary at the throne of God. They serve him night and day. Verse 16, they will hunger no longer, thirst no more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will shepherd them, guide them to the springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. They're, they're dead and alive. <laughs> they're in heaven. These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. They are not Jews. That is, these are Gentile believers from the great tribulation who lose their lives during the great tribulation. These are the ones that Satan goes to make war with. He couldn't get Jesus. He couldn't exterminate Israel. Who else is out there? Who, who, who else is affiliated with this one that I hate? Well, the Gentile followers of Jesus during the tribulation, they become the focus here of his next move. Look down at Revelation chapter 13. How will Satan go about doing this? Look at verse 7. Authority will be given to the first beast and the second beast. We'll learn more about them, Lord willing, in a few weeks. The Antichrist and his sidekick. It was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And he had authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. So Satan's strategy now is to dominate the whole world, uh, an entire unified world governance under his Antichrist, and to go after the followers of Jesus wherever they may be found. Look down at chapter 14, verse 6. There was an angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who inhabit the earth, to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he says, fear God and worship him. There you see the, the scope of the activity here is global. Look down at verse 12 of chapter 14. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. 
Chapter 14, verse 12, uses the same language as we just looked at in chapter 12, verse 17. The the rest of the children of Israel, these Gentile believers, are the ones who keep the commandments of God and have the witness of Jesus. In chapter 14, God describes their perseverance. And look at verse 13 of chapter 14. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, that they may rest from their labors. What does their perseverance look like? For many of them, it does not look like survival. It looks like martyrdom. For some, it will be survival. But for many, they will lose their lives. What is Satan's strategy in this making war with the rest of her children? According to chapter 13 and verse 8, he will demand that everyone worships the beast and whoever doesn't gets imprisoned or killed, verse 10 of chapter 13. And then look at verse 17 in chapter 13. No one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark of the beast, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. So what is his strategy? Demand that everybody by law worship the Antichrist. If you don't, you're going to prison or you're being killed. And then demand that if you don't take the mark of loyalty to the Antichrist, you can't even buy food. Can you imagine living at that time? No church. No ability to assemble together. Imprisoned, impoverished, hassled, and hunted. Many beheaded. This will be the most difficult time to follow Jesus anywhere in the world. The worst is yet to come for the disciples of Christ. And notice what the followers of Jesus are like. In verse 13 of chapter 12, they are described as keeping the commandments of God and having the witness of Jesus. Notice what they do and what they possess. What do they do? They obey. They keep Jesus' commandments. They follow his instruction. Remember, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what I say. You'll keep my commandments. And notice what they possess. They they possess the testimony of Jesus. They have the witness of Jesus. The, The word for witness is the same word we get martyr. Their witness is the proclamation, yes, I am loyal to Christ. I'm not taking that mark. I don't care if you starve me out. I don't care if you put me in jail. I don't care if you cut off my head. They maintain their witness, their testimony of fidelity to him. Under severe stress to compromise, to deny their faith, they can't buy or sell, they're on the run, there's nowhere on earth to escape. And we read in chapter 12, they did not love their lives even unto death. They are loyal to Christ even to the end. There's something of a takeaway for us in this. Love the church now. The ability to gather together like this. The the freedom to do so. The great privilege it is to be together. We don't neglect the assembling of ourselves with one another. Oh, how the tribulation saints will wish they could have these moments. The encouragement of being together, being under God's word together, singing his praises, encouraging each other with truth. You think about that word encouragement. That's not just flattery or a compliment. It means to give courage to one another. To encourage means to be around each other and speak to one another in such a way that we walk into our difficult worlds after Sundays with the courage to obey Christ and maintain our testimony of loyalty to Him. The church is a gift of God's grace in our difficult times. It will be gone during the worst of times. Notice here that Satan doesn't give up. He's defeated. And his efforts turn out totally fruitless. And yet he will not stop. He's relentless. I I hesitate saying we should learn from his example. (laughs) But think by contrast to our lives. Our outcome is secure. Our victory is inevitable. 
And yet our labors for God by Christ's strength and the power of his Holy Spirit for his name in this life last into eternity. As John MacArthur has said, fervency springs from a vision of heaven's reward. Do you think forward enough? Listen, Satan doesn't sleep and is a supernatural being. He doesn't need to. He's lost. He could give up and he doesn't. He is fueled by hatred. And you and I, fueled by love for God and love for humanity, ought to be relentless in our pursuit of those who need to hear the gospel. Consider your ministry, Christian. It will succeed. It will be rewarded. The outcomes are guaranteed. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.10, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. There's your statement about, I know there's a guaranteed outcome and it doesn't make me lazy. It makes me eager to endure everything for the sake of those chosen by God's grace so that they may obtain salvation. Paul knew God uses means to accomplish his inevitable ends. Be his means. And the great thing we discover is that he rewards us as we yield our lives as his means to his unfailing end. What is God's counter strategy to Satan's last flailing fury in this chapter? It is that the followers of Jesus overcome. We get a hint of that in verse 17. The dragon makes war with the the children who keep the commandments of God and and possess in an ongoing way. They keep possessing the testimony of Jesus. There's a hint in those verbs there that the followers of Jesus are faithful to the end. They persevere. They make it. That, That is the definition of an overcomer. When John wrote his letter to those churches in Asia Minor in 1 John, five times he uses the same word overcomer and he defines it this way. The overcomer is the one who believes in Jesus. Every believer is an overcomer by faith. You overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. You are victorious in the end. I want you to see the ways the followers of Jesus overcome in this context. Back to chapter 7 and verse 9. These tribulation martyrs stand before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands. They are victorious. They win. And they win even as they lost their lives. From an earthly perspective, that looks like a defeat. It is actually their glorious victory. And notice who populates that crowd in verse 9 of chapter 7. A great uncountable multitude from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. How successful will evangelism be in the world's worst chapter? Successful. In one sense, more successful than the church has been so far in her great commission. They overcome. We see this also in verse 14 of chapter 7. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They maintained their testimony. They, they lasted in fidelity to Christ. And consider that the Gentile believers who are killed during the great tribulation great tribulation, who stand in white robes in the presence of God in chapter 7, are all young believers. Tribulation martyrs, at the oldest, are seven years in the Lord. (laughs) Do you understand that? The church has been removed, gospel witness has been removed, and yet people come to faith during this awful time period. And they will have a level of maturity and fidelity to Christ that is tested beyond the severity of anything else that has been seen in the world. This is the remarkable power of God in the heart. We see their overcoming in chapter 13, verse 8. 
All who dwell on the earth will worship him, that is, worship the Antichrist. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world and the book of the life of the Lamb who's been slain. This gets to why are they overcomers? Why do they believe during the great tribulation? And why do they maintain their loyalty? Why do they not take the mark of the beast? Why are they willing to be starved out and beheaded and imprisoned for the sake of Christ? Because their names are written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world. They belong to Him. And who could take one of God's precious ones out of His strong hands? Not Satan in all of His fury. They are overcomers. Many are martyred. But some survive to populate the coming kingdom. This is what you have in Matthew 25 when Jesus describes the the sheep and goats judgment. And those who do not believe in him enter destruction. But those who believe in him, those tribulation survivors who are alive when he returns, they, they make it all the way to the end of this three and a half year awful period called the great tribulation. And they survive into the kingdom to populate Jesus' kingdom. So that it is not just Jews who are born again by the gospel who believe and enter the promised land. But people from all the tribes and nations who believe and survive. For whom a believing Israel becomes a blessing. In a golden era of world peace and prosperity that lasts a thousand years. In addition to that, according to Revelation chapter 20 verse 4. John says he sees the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their witness of Jesus and because of the word of God. Those who had not worshipped the beast or his image. They had not received the mark in their forehead or their hand. And they come to life and they reign with Christ for a thousand years. And then in Revelation 21, 7, this is the, the final sort of overcoming. What is an overcomer in the end? Revelation 21, 7. He who overcomes will inherit these things. The river of the water of life given freely by God for all without cost who are in him. And verse 7 says, and I will be his God and he will be my son. That refrain, I will be their God and they will be my people, is the great promise of the whole Bible. Trace it all the way through the scriptures and it is fulfilled there and given invariably to the overcomer. Who's the overcomer? The one who believes in Jesus. Listen, Christian, loyalty to Christ puts crosshairs on your life. You take up your cross and follow him, you are in the crosshairs of Satan's fury. You're affiliated with Jesus, you make Satan angry. And the more you are known for your identification with Christ, and the more hostile to the things of God the world becomes, the more you will feel the ire of the adversary from the world around you. America in the 19th and 20th centuries has been a bit fairly comfortable place to be a Christian. There is a Christian ethos and a Christian culture. There is Christian vocabulary in the way Americans talk. That doesn't mean you're born again because you're born here. Hardly. But it does mean that it's been easier to be a Christian in our day in this land than many other places around the world today and most other times in world history. Things may be growing worse. We do know that the world will get far worse before it gets better. And we learn this from 2 Timothy 3.12. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There's a lesson for us here, Christian. If you're a believer in Christ today, you will not be on the earth during the time we just looked at in Revelation chapter 12. That doesn't take you out of the crosshairs of the enemy. And it is normal to face persecution in the Christian life. In fact, the the higher your fidelity to Christ, the higher profile a target you are. And no doubt, if you've walked with Christ and you've entered into difficult relationships with those who don't love Christ, you've felt the personal offense of people all of a sudden don't like you. It's really not about you, it's about Jesus. But you're about Jesus, so it becomes about you. That's normal. That's not a green light to go be offensive just because you're a jerk. (laughs) But it does mean love Christ and the world's not going to automatically love you. Commentator John Phillips helpfully 
gives us hope. He says, what can Satan do with the likes of these? Lock them up in prison and they convert their jailers. Torture them and they consider it a privilege to be partakers of Christ's sufferings and heirs to great reward. Martyr them and they go straight to be with Christ. Let them loose and they evangelize the world. For all of Satan's strategies, for all of his counter punches, he loses. Let's pray. God, you win. We declare that with our lips. We, we sing that with our voices together. We rejoice in it. There is coming a day when we will sing without reservation your victories. For now we struggle. For now we waver in faith. Oh Lord, help our unbelief. We believe, but we need help. Would you strengthen us? Would you encourage us? Would you help us, oh Lord, to be loyal to you? Should the guillotine come and, and the beheadings start? Or should there be temptations for small compromises? Where disloyalty to you isn't a newspaper headline, but is done in secret. Help us, O oh Lord, to be faithful, to keep your commands, and to hold our testimony of fidelity to our Savior. And we could ask this only by your strength. Now, we could bring nothing of ourselves that would answer this prayer. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen.